So this is a, a different kind of talk. It's a little bit, uh, it goes back to the theme of complex adaptive systems that Ken started in the talk. Uh, has some of the flavor of uh, Ken's talk in trying to address broader questions. Uh, so my interest in this topic, a lot of it comes about in trying to deal with uh, environmental problems. And on many environmental problems like climate change, the scientific consensus is very strong. And yet, uh, adequate action has been lacking in dealing with it to a large extent because of social factors. The limitations are not in general scientific. I mean, of course, with the previous administration, one would get a lot of debates. But there's great scientific consensus <laughs> on these issues. And uh, it largely has to do with the willingness of people and governments to accept the scientific facts and then to take the steps that are in the common good. These are public goods problems and require cooperation. So there are mechanism design problems implicit in this. The problem is, as you all know, that we live in a global commons. They're public goods issues. Individual agents are acting largely in their own self-interest. And the social costs are not adequately accounted for. Uh, and this gets worse when the individual players are nations like ours. This is how we're seen uh, in the foreign press. Um, but these are every bit as much commons problems. Paul Krugman wrote a couple months ago asked why we need international cooperation on these issues. He said, because we have a global financial system in which a crisis that began with a bubble in Florida condos and California mansions caused monetary catastrophe. In Iceland, uh, we're all in this together. We need a shared solution. Uh, and therefore, and we had a lot of debate about this earlier in the week at the other meeting, uh, the invisible hand the conditions under which the theorems can be proven, which make lots of assumptions about convexity of the like, the uh, invisible hand doesn't protect society. Greenspan expressed shock, disbelief, and the need for regulation. Gretchen Morgenstern wrote on October 26th that Mr. Greenspan was shocked, shocked, to find out there was gambling going on in the <laughs> casino. <laughs> The point being that when you hear a lot of criticism of individuals and greed, et cetera, it suggests that the problem is not the system, but in, in other words, it's the mechanisms that determine the outcome. These were accidents waiting, waiting to happen. Uh, I mean, his point of view was basically that people weren't playing fair. Now, if you accept these arguments for, for economic systems, they're even more true, I think, or Don and I can debate there, at least is true for eco ecological and environmental systems. A popular theme some years ago in environmental sciences was uh, fostered by the, uh, the great in environmental scientist, James Lovelock, who said, who proposed something called, he called the Gaia hypothesis. And this was uh, basically the idea that since the biota um, regulate uh, to some extent, the environment. And since we live in that environment, the biota are controlling the physical chemical environment at just the right conditions for survival. And indeed, in its extreme form, this Gaia view basically argued that the biosphere is a superorganism that's been selected for its macroscopic properties, just like some invisible hand. The problems with Gaia which is anathema to any evolutionary biologist, is that Gaia is dealing with macroscopic regularities, and yet natural selection is operating at much lower levels. We have a complex adopt adaptive system. And just like in the economic system, natural selection is not operating for the benefit of the system as a whole. It's operating within the system. This is when Ken talked about complex adaptive systems. That adaptation, those mechanisms, are going on at lower levels and there's no reason to expect this to operate for the benefit of the system. So Gaia theory, in its extreme form at least, is flawed. There's no invisible hand that's around to preserve the biosphere. Therefore, a conclusion which is emerging is just as for economic systems, we need new institutions to address environmental issues uh, and to guarantee this international cooperation we need. So, Ecological systems, and this is where Ken started this off, and socioeconomic systems are both complex adaptive systems. And my definition of that is basically that it, it means a system that's made up of lots of individual agents 
that interact with each other locally in some sense, uh, form coalitions, et cetera, so that there are processes going on at multiple scales. This leads to a complexity, but a particular complexity that's the result of collective dynamics. And because of that, that means that patterns that we see at the macroscopic scale emerge from individual behaviors and feedback to influence those behaviors. Uh, and that individual variation within those systems is key because it tells you a lot about the capacity of the systems to adapt and to maintain robustness. And it's ro robustness is one point that I want to come back to uh, later in the lecture. Those emergent patterns do not guarantee any collective good. And here, and uh, I also will come back to this, but in a way it came up in Tim's talk, um, there's a fundamental difference between adaptation and optimization. And this is a, even for relatively sophisticated people thinking about how evolution works, creates what seems like a paradox. But Lewontin and Gould and others have emphasized that when you're talking about natural selection, you're talking about a process. It's a process of change that in some sense, that I'll show you in more detail, is hill climbing. But this is no guarantee that you're going to reach an optimal solution at the end. So there's a big difference between the process of adaptation and an end state, which might be optimization. Um, and even introduces the notion that populations can be evolving themselves to extinction, as we're probably doing. So this complex adaptive system perspective also means that management, whether you're talking about the, econ the economy or the environment, requires some sort of a balance between letting the system run free and some sort of regulation. And the new institutions that we develop are not ones that we ought to uh, fix in place, but have to be adaptive uh, and have to have features built in that maintain the robustness. And it also means uh, that cooperation is going to be essential to achieving solutions. So the challenges that I see, there's been a lot of discussion here about mechanism design, and, and uh, generally one assumes that one understands what the goals are for example, Eric laid out a bunch of principles that one would like to see achieved in any, uh, any voting system. And that's generally the place that Arrow's theorem or, or Don's results begins by assuming these are the things um, that uh, any sort of mechanism ought to have, any sort of voting system ought to have. But there are problems in environmental systems of determining what you want the objectives to be, and indeed, these are voting kinds of problems. How do you aggregate individual utility functions? And I'll come back to that point. How do you proceed from the microscopic to the macroscopic? How do you design mechanisms to achieve these goals? Uh, and uh, can we assess the robustness of these mechanisms? And indeed, I'm going to emphasize a lot an evolutionary perspective. Um, and that's basically where I'll start. In determining objectives, we have to deal with things like intergenerational and intragenerational equity. Intergenerational equity is a little tough because um, we don't have representatives of future generations, at least not the distant future, here, and we have to guess at what their utility function ought to be. Um, a second point, and we saw this a lot in Tim's talk, really, is that the utility functions that the, the people are using are frequency dependent. So, um, well, I guess actually your utility functions, you could talk about minimizing time. But in many cases, my utility functions based on what other individuals have around me. So how happy I am may depend not just on what I have, but how much you have and, and comparing what I have to the people around. So the frequent, frequency dependence becomes important. And again, as I mentioned, how do you aggregate them? How do you discount the future? So we discount the future. Uh, we discount the interests of other people, and different individuals are going to discount the future at different rates. Rich nations and poor nations uh, have different discount functions. Poor nations are concerned with just surviving till the next time period. And there's variation, obviously, within nations. Uh, different people have different levels of comfort. As we've seen, CEOs are likely to have a very different discount rate because they have to demonstrate results 
used to be at the next quarter, it's probably next week. Uh, so they have a higher discount rate, politicians the same. So how do we aggregate all of these things? I'll leave that to you guys. That's a mechanism design problem because that's a voting theory. But yeah. in, in part, the, the discount factors that, that you're attributing to CEOs and politicians are the, themselves the, the result of particular mechanisms that are in place, but mechanisms which sure. reward if you change the mechanisms, you would change their. Well, that's their a good time point. That's a good point. So it's not. I mean, it's, it's not fun. It's not just. It's just not linearly adding these things up. Yeah. It's changing the systems yeah. to take, take into account the fact yeah. that there is this heterogeneity yeah. in the system. Absolutely. So, in achieving sin, uh, sustainability, come back to this over and over again. Uh, we really need to figure out how to get international cooperation, and I'm going to build up to that from thinking about what we know from evolutionary theory about cooperation. The problem, of course, as we've heard a lot of discussion about, are free riders. And when you're talking about public goods, this leads to uh, the tragedy of the commons, a concept that I'm sure it's familiar to everybody here. So can an evolutionary perspective help in dealing with things like the robustness of systems, uh, discounting? I guess you were at the... <laughs> We've run a number of meetings at the Bayer Institute on various themes at the interface between ecology and economics. Um, one year, the topic was the evolution of discount rates. Why do people discount uh, at the rates they do? We didn't get very far that year. It was one of the few years that no paper came out of the meeting. Um, how does co cooperation arise? How does it maintain the uh, levels of robustness? How does leadership arise? How do we develop the heuristics that we use to make decisions in social situations? And indeed, might we develop mechanisms that utilize evolution? And, and uh, I'll talk about a couple of those that allow that, that where you can't solve what the optimal solution is, but you allow the system uh, an adaptive mechanism that hopefully would move it towards better solutions. I don't know the answer to that. So the approaches that, that can be taken here are one, and this is where I'll start, uh, to think about what we know about how evolution works and ask whether there are analogies with evolutionary theory. Secondly, to actually build formal models, involve replicator equations or something of that sort, in which we can actually solve to find the evolutionary optima. Uh, and when we can't do that, to simply use <laughs> simulations. And I'll show you some of those. But basically, uh, the approach that's used is to recognize that you have, in many of these problems, that you have ecological or behavioral interactions that are operating on a fast time scale that determine interactions. And then on some slower time scale, this, this is an approximation to how evolution works, um, aspects of those interactions, aspects of individual behaviors, or in the classical evolutionary theory, uh, these are heritable characteristics change. Uh, so there's a two time scale problem. It's not necessarily a two time scale problem, but it's convenient often to think about it as a two time scale problem with the way, the way individuals interact with each other, the strategies that they are using change on a slower time scale, uh, and then some payoff, some, some outcome occurs on a fast time scale. So relating those two time scales is a, is a current challenge in evolutionary ecology. What does classical evolutionary theory tell us? So let me start from the simplest theory, which is called Fisher's Fundamental Theorem of Natural Selection. And I won't derive this equation for you. But Fisher's Fundamental Theorem starts, so assumes you have a number of different genotypes uh, and works out the mathematics of it. It says that these genotypes are interacting with each other, reproducing. There are payoffs associated with them. Those are the so-called fitnesses. Um, and based on that, um, types by definition, types that do better come to be re represented in higher proportions of the population. That's the adaptation that's going on. You can demonstrate that under a suitable set of conditions, which I'll tell you, um, the mean fitness of the population, which is W bar here, that's the average, changes according to this formula. Everything on the right-hand side is po positive so that the mean fitness of the population increases monotonically. This is a fundamental theorem, and as with many fundamental theorems, it doesn't hold in most cases of interest. Um, what it assumes is that all of the fitnesses are constant. 
okay, among other things. It assumes random mating. It assumes you're dealing with a single locus, et cetera. But it's a very nice theorem, and what it tells you is you're always climbing hills. It doesn't say there's a unique equilibrium, but it says you're climbing hills towards some maximum, and eventually you come to rest, at least asymptotically, at that maximum. So it's a hill-climbing process, and this idea has been used by when one borrows from evolutionary theory to try to find, even to design jet engines and things of that sort. You have some fit or drugs. You have some fitness landscape, and you're optimizing on that landscape. So you're always climbing hills. So it's a very nice theorem, and it gives rise to the notion that it fits your intuition that if you're always climbing hills, in the end, you must arrive at some optimum, a local optimum, but at least an optimum. The trouble is there are lots of things wrong with this picture. First of all, there may be genetic constraints, and I'm not going to spend any time on them today, but I said this was all a single locus. If you have two loci, two points on the gene, that are interacting with each other in some nonlinear way, this can confound the process. It's like having multi-criteria optimization. You've got two different genes, and so you may not be able to reach the equilibrium you want. The landscape might be changing. It might be just fluctuating, and everything I said in there assumed the landscape was constant. In fact, it may be changing, and this is what gets interesting, due to frequency dependence or to coevolution. The only difference, frequency dependence means that the payoff to me depends on what other individuals are doing within the population. Coevolution means the payoffs to me depend on what other individuals are doing from other populations, maybe really other species. So it's really the same sort of idea, but it depends on what the unit is I'm thinking about. So the result of that, and these are the two things that I'm going to think of this all as frequency dependence, the result of that is that instead of climbing hills on a fixed landscape, you're on a waterbed. And as you climb up one particular peak, you're pushing it down and something else is popping up. Okay, so the landscape is changing temporally, and it's changing as a result of evolution that's ongoing. So what that means is with frequency dependence, the mean fitness can trend downhill. You can come up with very good examples that shows that mean fitness not only doesn't have to increase, but it can be grading gradually less. Imagine a situation where individuals are deciding what habitat to go and exploit, and they all move to the best habitat. As they move to that habitat, it gets more crowded, less attractive, and that pushes down the fitness advantages of that. It's, in fact, I think, just what Tim was just talking about, raises paradox. I think the example that you gave is exactly the example of that, and you could put that into Fisher's theorem, but with a frequency-dependent lens. That's basically what you did. I think for you. Huh? I think for you. Yeah. So, um, so this is the, is the best example, I, can, I mean, the easiest example I can think of that contradicts people's simple interpretation that, if, after all, if evolution is constantly replacing or continuously replacing types by types that are doing better, you must be climbing some sort of hill and uh, ending up at some optimum. You're not. You can be going downhill, and in fact, uh-oh. Everything's okay. Okay, this uh, evolution to extinction is possible. What people have called evolutionary suicide. Populations can keep going downhill till they reach some point of collapse. So this emphasizes the distinction between adaptation and optimization. So to deal with frequency dependence, and most of you will know this too, John Maynard Smith took the Nash sorts of ideas into evolutionary theory, and he introduced the notion. <coughs> Uh, the game theoretic notion of an evolutionarily stable strategy. That's simply a strategy that, once it's established in the population, can't be invaded by any other type. If the whole population is made up of this type and you introduce a mutant uh, that's slightly different, its payoff is going to be less. That's an evolutionarily stable strategy. And it's natural to think that that's what evolution ought to do, is produce these types. But things become more complicated if we study the dynamics of these sorts of games. So to do that, I want to introduce the framework for thinking about the evolutionary dynamics of phenotypes. Let's say, to make it simple, phenotypes equals genotypes. We're not going to think about diploid genetics and all that kind of stuff. This is a very uh, phenomenological approach. 
And the way it operates is to think about the growth rate of a, of a, of a mutant genotype in an environment that's been defined by some resident type. So you remember at the beginning, I split these two time scales. Let's suppose we have one type in the population. It's achieved some sort of an equilibrium. That's U. And now I've got a rare type V uh, that arises due to a mutation. Uh, and I can compute the growth rate of that rare type. And this is a linear problem because the, the new type is rare. And so the question is, how well does it do in the environment defined by U? So typically, what we'd be looking at is the linearized growth rate of the population, maybe uh, a dominant eigenvalue of a matrix or something of that sort. In some cases, and I'll mention it now and then say nothing more about it, it may be that the resonant type doesn't actually reach an equilibrium, but it's in some periodic type. And then you have to do something like uh, uh, use a floquet exponent. But that's all <coughs> I'm going to say about that now. So uh, from now on, I'm going to assume scalar phenotypes just to make things easy. So this is what you have to do to think about an evolutionarily stable strategy. This is Maynard Smith's idea. Here's the resonant type here. Here's the invader. Here's the diagonal. And the idea is that things are in equilibrium. I'm going to make that assumption. And, uh, and therefore, this is the line. If u is equal to v, then the growth rate of v in the environment defined by u is equal to 0. This is all in continuous time. So the assumption of equilibrium means that if the invader is exactly the same as the resident type um, r, the growth rate of the invader is equal to 0 because it's no different than the resident type. So this line is defined by r of uv equals 0, which means I can take a first derivative along that line, a directional derivative, and I get the rdu plus the rdv equals 0. This is the putative EFSS, but everywhere along that time line, the rdu plus the rdv is equal to 0. This is going to be useful later, because sometimes I'm going to be thinking about critical points with respect to u, the resident type, and other times critical points with respect to v. But what this means is along this line, they're exactly the same. Because if one is 0, the other is 0. Okay. So uh, because they're the same, I don't really need to distinguish anymore. All right. That's, that's uh, an ESS. Uh, uh, well, I haven't actually said what an ESS yet. Yeah, but an ESS is one where r of v and u, the growth rate of the invader, is maximized as a function of v when v is equal to u, at least locally. <coughs> All right. So picture is up here. Here's u. And this is the growth rate of types close to u. They're always less than u, or at least they're not greater than u. They can't uh, invade. So r of u is maximized as a function of v at v equals u. Mathematically, ignoring the, uh, the boundary cases, uh, the RDV equals 0, and the second derivative is less than or equal to 0, the standard maximization. Uh, the distinguishing between whether this is less than or equal to 0 and less than is not something I want to get into. No. Okay. The difficulty is that's just a beginning. Uh, first of all, minor point, there might be a lot of different ESSs. That's not really an issue. But more complicated, less intuitive, is that the evolutionarily stable strategy may not be reachable by an evolutionary mechanism. Now, I have to tell you what I mean by that, but I'll do that in just a second. So we need the notion of an, a convergence-stable strategy. Uh, Elon Eschel may have been the first to introduce this. I'm not sure. So what do I mean by an evolutionary mechanism? Remember, I said I'm going to allow a type to reach equilibrium, then I'm going to introduce a mutant type. So I'm, they're imitating the way evolution works. Um, and uh, I say that a strategy is reachable if, by this process of letting things come to equilibrium and then introducing a mutant, and if that mutant does better, it replaces the type that's there, if I will eventually cur uh, converge to a strategy. So what are the conditions that guarantee that that will happen? They're not the same as they are for something to be an ESS. What, if this is a, some, a convergence-stable strategy, that means that if I start with a resonant type here, 
and introduce a mutant, which is closer, at least locally, that this type will do better. In other words, the, uh, the RDV is now not equal to zero. It must be greater than zero if I'm to the left, and it must be less than zero to the right. And that's what it will mean to converge to that strategy. Right? All right. Well, now I can take a, so this is the RDV. I can take a directional derivative of the RDV along here. And what that means is, and this is just the directional derivative of the RDV, it means this must be less than or equal to zero because it's going from positive to, to negative. So this is the condition that tells me if this is convergence stable. Now, notice this involves a mixed derivative. So another thing I can do is take the second directional derivative along this line here, which will be d squared r du squared plus twice the mix plus d squared r dv squared equals zero. I can use that to get rid of this term as minus one half the sum of d squared r du squared, d squared r dv squared. And when I finish doing that, what I end up with is this condition that d squared r dv squared must be less than or equal to d squared r du squared. So this is the condition for convergence stability. All right, now let's compare this with the ESS condition. Um, the ESS condition said that this had to be negative. But notice that um, that's neither necessary nor sufficient for this to be true because it depends on this. So in other words, an ESS may not be attracting. And there are perfectly sensible cases where it's not. In fact, well, I won't go into that. And an attracting strategy doesn't have to be an ESS. <laughs> there is also another concept, which is called a neighborhood invader strategy, which means a strategy that can invade any nearby strategy. It turns out that if you're an ESS and a neighborhood invader strategy, that is sufficient to make you convergent stable, but neither one of those is necessary. So this makes things a little bit more complicated. And it means, for example, you can get things like this. What, what's going on? Uh, it, we understand more or less, or at least I think I do, what's going on when something is in ESS, but you can never get there. And then the question is, if you can never get there, it, even though it might be what, uh, what would be the optimal strategy from your perspective, um, you know, if you're designing a system, maybe I, you could design that to be the best strategy. But if you allowed an evolutionary strategy to try to find it, it would never find it. Uh, the other side is if something's an, attractive, an attracting strategy but not an ESS, what does that mean? That means you move towards it, but once you get there, you bifurcate. Uh, once you get there, it's invadable by other strategies. So either one of these things can happen. They both happen quite, um, uh, in quite realistic cases. So let's go back to the question of can an evolutionary perspective help, but with this in the back of our mind that these sorts of odd things can happen. Uh, and the sorts of problems that I think it's useful to apply these to are can it help to understand um, what, how system, whether systems are robust? Can it help us in dealing with discounting? I've already talked about that and I'm not going to say more about it. Can it help us to understand how cooperation and leadership arise? Uh, and it can help us to understand how heuristics and social norms arise. And just like Ken, for the most part, I'm not going to answer these questions. I'm just raising them. All right. Maintaining robustness, I, I, I just want to um, mention, and I guess Ken mentioned it too explicitly, is not necessarily a good thing. It's a good thing if you're where you want to be. Uh, but if you're dealing with the economic system, it's, we don't want the current situation to be robust. We want to get back to something that's good and robust. So, um, so the next question is, what makes systems robust? And again, Ken hinted at some of these things. Does evolution increase robustness? Um, this, is, uh, this is something that uh, John Doyle uh, and others have been thinking about in terms of what they call highly optimized tolerance and how to evolve, how to develop. Um, robust systems. Um, so this is your governor, or at least that's how he used to look. That's what he looks like. <laughs> so th this is robustness, uh, before and after. Uh, and Ken talked about these different notions. And there are a lot of words that are out there. But in various contexts, the terms robustness, 
and resilience, meaning the ability to spring back from uh, being perturbed, and rigidity or resistance all mean the same thing. Uh, they all mean the capacity of the system to keep functioning uh, in the presence of external influences. Think about biological organisms in turbulent environments. Uh, let's say the turbulent marine environments. There are at least two different extreme strategies. One is you can be like a carl um, and just be resistant to the flow. And the other is you can be like a bull kemp and go with the flow. So these are both mechanisms that, uh, uh, that make systems robust, but on different scales. Rigid design, like the, like the Polaroid design that didn't change very much over long periods of time, but was a very good strategy, for a while might work best over short time scales, or if the environments are relatively constant. Um, but over longer periods of time, you may need flexible design. And Kodak has evolved, uh, and of course, uh, other sorts of uh, companies as well, towards digital strategies that are much, have been much more adaptive. It's not that one is better than the other, but they have different discount rates associated with it, if, whether you want something that's going to work today or is going to be there for the long period of time. But in changing environments, um, Basically, uh, one has to just keep running like the Red Queen to stay in place. Larry Slobodkin, uh, an evolutionary biologist, wrote an article many years ago uh, in which um, he said that if evolution is a game, it's one that probably uh, was invented by Sartre where, where the uh, payoff in the game is just being allowed to keep playing the game. So a lesson from this is in order to achieve, the, the robustness has some paradoxical features, and in order to achieve robustness at one level, you often have to over, overcome it at other levels. So this is uh, a cartoon of the influenza virus. The influenza virus has surface antigens, um, proteins, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase that the, your immune system and your cells recognize. Uh, Influenza has survived for centuries, maybe millennia, by constantly changing these so that the strains that you see today are different than the strains you saw last year or certainly five years ago. Influenza survives by constantly changing its surface antigens. In one way, you could say influenza has been very robust, but if you thought about it at the level of individual strains, this is competition between strains and they replace each other. The robustness at the macroscopic level is because of the lack of robustness at the level of individual strains, because it's a more of a Kodak than a Polaroid strategy. What are the key features of robustness? Well, I put them at the apices of, a, of this triangle. One is the maintenance of the ability to make adaptation. That's how your immune system works. That's how uh, influenza work, diversity and heterogeneity. Uh, multiple institutions, multiple remediation mechanisms. A second that trades off against that is redundancy, uh, having multiple copies of things that are, uh, are crucial. Um, you, you will all remember uh, that about uh, four or five years ago, maybe less, I can't remember what year it was, there was a crisis because one of the two companies that made the influenza vaccine in the U for the U.S. <coughs> audience, I think it was a French company, actually. Was it uh, hmm? I thought it was really um, Developed tainted vaccines, which couldn't be used. We, we were fortunate that year. There, it wasn't a bad year, and we had enough uh, vaccines. But it does uh, um, introduce the thought that if you're going to design a system to be robust, maybe having only two companies that produce some critical um, product is not the way to go. So redundancy is an important part of the picture. Uh, and Ken mentioned modularity. Designing a system to be modular means that, uh, among other things, uh, when there's a disturbance that interrupts part of the system, it doesn't spread to the whole system. And uh, this was an idea, actually, that was I think introduced first by Herbert Simon, but I'm sure it was in the, um, in the literature and other forms before that. So all of these things, in some sense, trade off against each other. Evolution, for evolutionary biology, especially in what's called evo-devo, is a lot of interest now in modularity. 
because modularity is a way you save your work. It prevents uh, disturbances from spreading to the whole system. And it also provides substructures that allow you to build on them in order to create um, other structures. So it speeds the evolutionary process. Now let me go back to the question of how does cooperation evolve. There are many systems in nature. So to begin by thinking about the evolutionary. So Eric, what time am I supposed to stop? How long? Uh, at 3.53. So in uh, eight minutes. Okay. I'll take nine. Okay. Um, so I won't get through everything I wanted to say, but there are lots of examples of cooperative behavior in nature. Uh, I will skip over some of the things that I'm going to say here. Um, but indeed, the, um, the social insects provide a classic example, uh, but even bacteria cooperate, and I don't have time to talk about them, but they send out signals that lead to um, cooperation and plaque formation, which is why you have to go to the dentist. There's hundreds of species of bacteria on your teeth. So this was something that puzzled Darwin. Uh, and the first steps to clearing that up were, up, were due to W.D. Hamilton, who, uh, who exploited the um, knowledge of the high genetic relatedness among the haplodiploid insects. Males come from unfertilized eggs, so females share three quarters of their genes. Uh, and this means that kin selection is a powerful mechanism, but it's not the only one. You can get cooperation among uh, unrelated individuals. Reciprocal altruism. My student Lee Warden and I wrote a paper um, about two years ago, which I'm happy to send to anyone, called Evolutionarily Escape from Prisoner's Dilemma. This was really Lee's thesis work. And basically, the idea was you start with a matrix like Prisoner's Dilemma. And Eric and I are interacting through this <coughs> matrix. And in step one of this process, um, I and he optimize my strategy for this given game matrix. But then on a slower time scale, I explore other matrices, um, maybe by initial accidents. So. This is a nearby, this is my payoff down here. And this, I explore nearby matrices. And these payoffs are chosen from this, some distribution. And what happens is, as I ex accidentally explore these mutant strategies, uh, if I get better, I, I, and then optimize on those, if I get better payoffs, I replace this parent matrix that I had before by this new matrix, and then explore deviations of that new strategy. And what happens over time? Uh, these red lines are the off-diagonal elements, is that the payoffs gradually increase. In fact, they can increase to the stage that, um, that, the, that the new payoffs are even higher than what they would, would have been through cooperation originally, even though the diagonal terms don't change very much generally. The off-diagonal terms change by this exploration of this mutant process. So this iterative process can lead to uh, higher payoffs. Uh, I'll skip over this, but uh, repeated interactions among unrelated individuals can also be there. Uh, and this is work that Rick Durrett and I did on uh, spatially explicit models where you only interact with your neighbors. And in the situation in which you couldn't get cooperation in a well-mixed game, in an explicitly spatial game, cooperation uh, can arise. But I better skip that given a little bit of time. Uh, I've left. So in ways like this, small groups can escape prisoner's dilemma. But how do we get to cooperation in larger groups like society? <laughs> this involves social norms and customs that are shared, uh, enforcement mechanisms. And the question is, how do we get there? Um, so imitation can drive large changes in human behaviors. The fundamental sorts of questions that uh, have to be um, investigated for studying the dynamics of decisions are things like how this is what's generally done. How are individuals affected by the social context they find themselves in? But much less work on the question that I'm interested in. How does this, except Brian has done a lot on this, how does the social context itself, which is the collective result of individual behaviors, evolve? And how does leadership arise? And I guess that's the last thing I'll have time to talk about, and I apologize to the locals who heard me talk about this 
a couple weeks ago, but I think it's relevant, so I'd like to go into it. And this is work with my postdoc and now colleague, Ian Cousin. So in order to look at the emergence of leadership, or at least the effects of leadership, what we did is we looked at an individual-based model, and this was a model of animal movement in physical space, but I'd like you to think about it as opinion dynamics in opinion space. So every individual has a velocity vector associated with it. Every individual updates its velocity vector at discrete time steps in relationship to either what it thinks it ought to be doing, for example, where the target is, and secondly, what its neighbors are doing. It may move towards or away from its neighbors, et cetera. And I think, given the time, I'm just going to skip ahead as to how this is done, except to say that the updating vector is an average of the social vector, which may be an average of the positions or the velocities of other, of my neighbors, and the intrinsic information vector. Not every individual pays much attention to this. Every individual has its own weighting function, omega. If omega is small, all I'm doing is paying attention to other individuals. If omega is infinite, all I'm doing is paying attention to myself. So you can think about high omega as, for example, our ex-president, and we even allow omega to be adaptive. In other words, if you think you ought to be going in some direction and nobody's coming with you, you may actually reduce omega unless you're really stubborn. So this is what happens if you have 100 individuals, one of whom wants to go up here, 99 of whom are just followers. That one individual is still pulled back into the group, and as you can see, nothing much happens. The group doesn't move anywhere. But if I move that to five individuals, then they find their way out to the front, and the group is drawn up to the right. And if I make that 10 informed individuals, the group moves rather efficiently up to the right. So what this tells us is that animal groups can be led by a small number of individuals. In fact, let me just skip down to here. This is the number of individuals. This is the accuracy, or how fast the group moves up to the right. And as soon as you get up to about 10 individuals, the group moves about as efficiently as it can move to the right. We've also looked at what happens if there are, for example, five leaders who want to go up here and five who want to go down here. How do individuals reach consensus? If the difference is not too great, they split the difference, but there's a bifurcation point that's reached as the difference becomes large when the group either goes one way or the other or might split. So we've done a lot of work to try to understand those bifurcations by looking at a coupled oscillator model, but it's a little bit off the target, so given the time, I'll skip over that, except to say that this model is a gradient system. And so, in fact, what happens, we can show formally, is that the red dots want to go this direction, the blue dots want to go here, and the black dots are just followers. And, in fact, we can begin to explain that bifurcation behavior. So let me skip over further discussion of this. What we're looking at now, I mean, that's the result of having particular strategies that are built in. So a natural question to ask, I think, is how do these strategies evolve? What are the best strategies for individuals to use? This is exactly, I think, a question that could be asked about me driving my car in your traffic. If I'm driving, do I want to basically follow my own instincts or imitate what other individuals are doing? From the viewpoint of the group, if everybody is following their own rules, then they'll find food, for example, which is what's pictured here. But it's ignoring the advantages of a collective strategy. On the other hand, if all everybody does is to follow other individuals, then everybody will be in a big group, but it won't have anything to do with where the food is. So from the group's point of view, the optimal thing to do is some balance between them. But this is generally not a group situation. It's every individual maximizing its own behavior, like in Tim's lecture. And therefore, the question is what happens 
in an evolutionary model. So the idea is you, is you, you provide individuals um, resources at, uh, which they have to find and, um, and allow different strategies in terms of following and leading and, uh, uh, and ask what strategies evolve. And we've done this by looking at different fitness functions, some of which only take into account your own interest and some of which include a term uh, at the, like we saw in John's lecture, um, which uh, is other regarding and says it's my fitness plus some average of the fitness of other individuals in the population. We can look at the full spectrum. Um, I, I'm going to skip over all of this coming down to the end I, to, to work on social norms. Uh, but obviously, in trying to understand social norms and how they evolve, and the experiments like the ultimatum game, um, there, there are two sorts of questions to ask as well. <clears throat> one is, if one assumes particular degrees of other regarding behavior, what is the outcome? That's basically what I was just talking about, and that's what's generally done in these sorts of models. I have a graduate student visiting my, some of you know Carlo Carraro, the economist in Venice, and uh, one of his students is visiting me now and has begun to, we've begun, but uh, he's been leading it, to develop uh, models that take into account the Fair-Schmidt sorts of results. Uh, and, but this still asks if, there's, uh, if there are other regarding behaviors, for example, where your payoff function um, is not just your own payoff, but looks not just at how much worse off you are than other individuals, but how much better off you are in other individuals and penalizes you if you're too much uh, better off, what sorts of outcomes can arise. But I don't have time to, to uh, talk about this, and nor does this address the question of um, how other regarding uh, uh, behaviors emerge. So I think at that point, um, with this one slide I will quit, which is to say that in all of this, um, and understanding what the role of leadership is and what the role of uh, group identity is. Um, one of the hardest questions is understanding how groups form, not just their influence, but how groups form, how they are sustained, uh, how they break down. Um, what maintains, for example, um, the persistence of particular religions over time? Um, and I've run out of time, so I'll just stop there. Thank you. I didn't have a question, it was an observation. Uh, and that's fair Schmidt uh, structure. Their, their, their restrictions on the parameters are such that they rule out a whole bunch of those interesting mm -hmm. social preferences. Uh, and if you go back, if you take Charnas Rabin or some other things, where you, you get, I mean, essentially, fair Schmidt preferences will have no altruism in them anywhere. That is, you, it's, it's basically a focused on, uh, on asymmetric fairness issues. And it rules out people who care about just the average uh, welfare of the group. So you, you can, by changing the, the range of the restrictions, you can get back to yeah. We're not too far into this, so I'd be happy yeah, to talk to you about this. So you, uh, there, there are ways to get, I mean, if you stick with this formulation, you're not going to be able to do what you want to do, mm -hmm. so I'm suggesting you're going to have to be a little more careful. But there's a, enough range to allow you to yeah, I'm actually, in terms of the mechanics of these models, actually reminded of some work we did on, um, um, on um, animal grouping behavior because uh, there's evidence that, uh, that animals, on the one hand, don't like to be isolated, in some species, don't like to be isolated, so they don't like to be too far away from the group. On the other hand, they don't like to be too close. So you, you get this attraction repulsion, uh, which includes in it a, a, an aspect of... Um, of um, seeking equity, but yeah, but heterogeneity in these parameters turns out in groups turns mm -hmm. out to be really helpful in getting sort of some kind of thing that you can't get from if the groups composed all of one type of them. So I, that's another thing to keep in mind. The heterogeneity. Guy. I'll look uh, forward to talking to you some about that. Yeah. So is this? Um, it, 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 Regarding the other regarding behavior model, is this a? Are you looking for 
fixing some kind of input function and then looking at what's the behavior that's resulting. Well, what I'm really interested in is, um, is actually not this, but it's an understanding why other regarding behavior <coughs> emerges. How do we develop the rules, the heuristics? Uh, and um, what I think, um, so why is it that we see the anomalous, apparently anomalous behavior that we see in something like the ultimatum game? Uh, and one of the um, the explanations that it, that I find most most persuasive, and for which Brian and his students have done some work, is that um, is that these situations are anomalous situations, in the sense that you're looking at a behavior for which bounded rationality rules have have evolved, and so individuals are not necessarily behaving optimally within particular situations to understand the evolution of these behaviors, you've got to embed this particular situation in a metagame where you don't actually know what the game is going to be. And then just like optical illusions, uh, which involve using rules that work well on the average, it's easy to find situations that misfire. So that's really the direction I want to move with these sorts. But so, so what, I mean, what, what I can tell from, from the model that I did, uh, is you can get out, you can get out regarding behavior, and this is kind of uh, the reciprocal of these my idea, which is similar. To it. Um, when you have a, as when you have games, even uh, games with perfect conflict between individuals in terms of their payoffs, when you have games where they are, there's there's a dynamic feedback between you know, phase by phase games, and, and if you increase your partners, your, your other players, players there, you can, in in return you get some return in that in the future. And um, and there are there are there are some conditions which under which that gives you um, the the result of the behavior dynamic gives you fitness results in, in such fitness that if you're other regarding without and that's not reciprocity you, you don't calculate you know future returns but fitness calculation does for does that for you other regarding preferences become individual optimal yeah but so this is yeah okay, but so there are many situations that can be explained to that but they're clearly behaviors. Uh, where uh, individuals are, I mean, maybe you could embed it in that framework, but individuals are behaving in ways it, it, that you, they clearly can't expect to pay off unless it's going to be in heaven somewhere. I mean, and I think that's, that, that's a real, I don't, I don't think that's a real possibility, but I think it's a real possibility that, that that's why individuals uh, are doing that. But, but there, I, I think what you've said is part of the explanation, but another part is they're applying rules yeah that they're afraid to deviate from, even though they don't, re well, they don't really expect to pay off. A, a senses of fairness, for example. Um, when two years ago, I guess, or was it last year, when Jean Emsminger was here, she talked about the differences between the ultimatum game and the dictator game. Well, all of you know what that is. And, and that in some situations, people actually are more generous in the dictator game situation um, when when it's no longer a game, but when it's just their sense, their ethical sense that's it. Yeah. So I don't see how that can be explained by that mechanism. It's rather because now maybe maybe it's you can put it in that framework by saying, well, the payoff is in how good I feel about myself, and that's part of my utility function, and that probably well, the, the subjective payoff is, can can be that, but then um, <laughs> as a result, of the subjective payoff kind of drives what you do. Mm -hmm. you know, in the in the game, but you do behaviorally, and then that kind of that the dynamics can basically give rise to a material payoff, an objective payoff, and that determines your fitness. So then, so in that sense, there's probably a framework to put it in to make yeah, it. Yeah. So I, I yeah. Yeah. I, I have a, a conceptual question. Uh, you were talking before about the influenza virus, which. Uh, in which there's a tension between uh, macroscopic <coughs> robust stability on a macroscopic level uh, produced by uh, considerable instability on, on a microscopic level. But uh, how, uh, it, how do you even define what macroscopic stability is? Because after all, one, one work one uh, organism or one uh, uh, phenotype is, 
It's no, really I, replacing the other. I, I was only talking. I'm only talking about it in terms of our our level of observation of the system, mm -hmm. which um, and, and basically pointing out that if you want to talk about robustness, you have to talk about what scale you're talking about robustness. From from an evolutionary point of view, there's no con there's no contradiction. It's competition between strains. But this competition between strains produces an environment in which new strains are continually replacing old strains. That's right. And therefore, the, the consequence of that is that um, all of these strains lump together. Uh, I'm not, it's, this is not a strategy, by the, but all of these strains lump together uh, become more persistent. Um, I mean, it's just an observation of the dynamics, the fact that influenza has been around a long time. And if you had a, um, if you, if you had a, a pathogen, which you often do, that doesn't have this high evolutionary potential, then it's there's a much better chance to eliminate it. You, you say influenza has been around a long time. Yeah. What, uh, what makes it still influenza? It's quite different from <coughs> from the organism that w was around. Well, this is always the you know this is always the uh, question when you say yeah. a particular species has been around yeah. any species around a well, long there are, time. There are ways you're of defining, defining you're defining there. characteristics that become uh, less and less specific. If you know if I wanted to define this. This is only a definitional problem. If we wanted to define this in terms of um, what's going on at every nucleotide, at every every locus, um, then it hasn't. Those particular strains have not been around a long time. But if I lump them together, mm -hmm. you know, if I if I said life's been around a long time, yeah, that's different than saying particular species. That has nothing. That doesn't change the biology at all. It's yeah. only the level of description that I'm imposing on the system. So what makes it influenza? Well, influenza is not actually too hard to define because um, even when these mutational changes occur, you can match up the new sequence to the old one. There's a one-for-one -one transformation. You have um, eight strands. The influenza virus, basically the genome is made up of, um, of eight different strands, and that's a continual. Future, but we have influenza. I was talking about influenza A. There's also influenza B. Um, if I wanted to lump them together, um, I'd get a different definition. So, I, if you wanted to answer the question of how long it's been around, you'd have to address your question of what do you, what do you mean? When is it no longer influenza? But you know the old story about uh, who, who was it? Was it George Washington who chopped down the cherry tree? That's right. Right. And somebody said, I've got George Washington's hatchet. Here, of course, it's had four new heads and six new handles <laughs> since then. And so is it still, I mean, that, but this is a philosophical problem. This is not a biological question. Yeah. You basically define it by um, you know, lineage continuity. Because well, I mean, that's one way to do it. Yeah. You, you, uh, if, it's, if, it's, if it's robust, if it's variable, then you will have a material con continuity of material between all the... But if you define it that way, then... then the guy, Person That's still right. had George Washington's hatchet. But, but the, but the yeah. way of defining, you, you wanted to make an analogy between influenza and, uh, say, a social system, it's like like a yeah. uh, an agreement to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and and, and so from that point of view, the the question of how you define con continuity of the organism. Well, I mean, you could ask the same. Question. Thinking about important. Guantanamo, you yeah. could ask the same the same question about our culture. Yeah. Here, right? What does it mean to preserve our culture uh, if you had to um, suppress um, um, sufficient yeah. number of values yeah. in order to preserve it? Is it still the same system? So this, the, the, these are not scientific questions, really, but it's a question of what does it mean? So I don't know whether the lineage thing is right because you've also got problems if you had a circumpolar. Uh, 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 species that so that uh, um, so that this was clearly the same species as this and this distributed around near uh, the globe and this is the same as this but it may be that, that these individuals at these extremes couldn't breed with each other that may be the case for example with dogs that have evolved so much variation that they are all one species I mean all domestic dogs but probably the uh, Except by artificial insemination, the largest and the smallest couldn't possibly breed. Is that one species? But it is. You, you, you would probably be able to still split it in, into branches. And the, the real, I guess, the real problem with the lineage 
you know, accounting would be would arise when you have horizontal fast <coughs> you know, maybe as in, as in bacteria and, and as in cultures. Well, bacteria is another yeah. set of problems. I, I don't get that's because they exchange yeah. uh, uh, extra chromosomal information through plasmids, but. Uh, but I mean, that, this is this is what systematists do: is, is deciding whether things are the same species or different yeah. species, and it, it doesn't change the biology. It's just uh, how the the uh, uh, the particular binning that the humans want to 